The facts don't. Uh, the facts don't fit the theory. Change the facts. I'm Dave DeHilser. You've reached Science Saturday. Science no, Saturday Science Chats. Man, I need to warm up before I get on air, folks. But today we're gonna. You're gonna try to convince me that ether exists. <laughs> Hello, hello again. I'm Dave DeHilser, and we are the Saturday Science Chats. And this is sponsored by the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society and Dissident Science. And if you are a person that normally or wants to come into the green room, well, guess what? I had it all screwed up. I didn't have that. Fi uh, a couple of minutes before the uh, broadcast, I realized I did not fix this link because every week I've got to change this, what we call subdomain to point to the right place. So if you are trying to get into the green room, that is, if you want to chat with me live, tell me why Ether exists, you can do so by going to live.naturalphilosophy.org and you can get in. I know normally we have a five or six or seven people that are always here and they didn't get in. They're probably trying to figure out why. But uh, again, today we're going to be talking about Ether and you can and also in the comments uh if you would like to ask a question you can uh do, let's see right here i've got a little instruction for that right here da, 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 da. so I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later so i again discombobulated because when you go in the air and realize your whole green room entrance door is locked and people are outside waiting to get in um, that's a problem so let me go ahead and start i do see people coming in now to the green room so again i apologize if you want to come and talk to me on air uh, go to live.naturalphilosophy.org <clears throat> Got a frog in my throat this morning. Ah. Anyways, it's going to be a really great time. So let me share my um, screen here. And we're going to take a look today uh, at Ether. But first, I always want to talk tell you about what we are. We are the Saturday Science Chats, uh, sponsored by John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society and Dissident Science. And today... Our topic is convince me ether exists. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. Do I believe ex ether exists? I'll tell you in just a little bit what my opinion is, but of course, uh, it's only one opinion. And 
I want to thank again all of you who are tuning in. It's greatly appreciated. And last week, I do apologize. We had we were going to air with this exact same program, but what happened is we got an opening to get a COVID vaccine, and my dad, who is 82, who uh, hopefully will be in here to help me out here, but he uh is 82 and of course didn't have a vaccine yet so we got those vaccines from what i heard we got the moderna one and the moderna one gives you protection up to 80 percent uh for covid uh, covid 19 of course it mutates but at least that's what they say in the first two weeks then you get your second one goes over 90 percent so that's good uh, for those who want to do it so free world you can do what you want i guess uh but anyways i want to thank all of you for tuning in for watching this for watching this on recording i know a lot of people watch this recorded and it's greatly appreciated and remember to always when you watch this recorded or even live go down and click on the like button and subscribe hit the little bell and you can even set it to get uh, alerted when our we go live uh, and uh, you can do that either on the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society YouTube channel or my dissident YouTube channel. We're heading our way to a thousand subscribers on the uh, CNPS website and also uh, YouTube channel and Dissident Science. We're heading our way to 4,000 subscribers. So again, I want to thank everybody. And if you do do a super chat, obviously I will read that. Uh, your question, if you want to put up uh, something that will be guaranteed I put up there, you can do a super chat. What's a super chat you say? Well, you can give them any money, I think amount of money, like $2 on the way up. And that, that amount of money, all that money goes to the organization. Doesn't go to me. Uh, I got my own job, so I'm okay. But uh, that goes to the organization. And of course, uh, that's greatly appreciated and it helps pay for this over a couple thousand dollars just to have all these things that we do every week. Um, of course, this is where critical thinkers meet. The John Chappelle uh, uh, Philosophy Society provides an open forum for study, debate, and presentation of serious ideas uh, that are not commonly accepted in mainstream science. Uh, we use the term natural philosophy in its broader sense, which is which includes physics, cosmology, mathematics, and philosophy of science. Uh, our goal is to return to the basics where things went wrong and start anew. I think that's from our website. So our mission is to be an organization above all that promotes critical thinking da -da, without malice. And that is, yeah, you can say, hey, Big Bang's wrong and we will not, you know, call you stupid or a crackpot um, because we are all free thinkers and have the ability to think on our own, although not a whole lot of people do. It's sad uh, to be an organization that supports and publishes and promotes serious work outside mainstream, to provide a forum debate for topics in physics, cosmology, philosophy, and mathematics, and to provide a forum for presenting serious papers and theories without fear of censorship, and to be run and controlled entirety by our membership and of course who we are we are open to challenging mainstream science we allow and encourage competing ideas or models what there's only the universe is only one way no folks the universe is not only one way um huh. well the universe is the universe that's true <laughs> step back the universe is the universe there's only one of them and um we have many different uh, ideas about how that would work or models. Follow, we, all, we do follow the scientific method. I think there's a lot of people say, oh, you guys throw everything out for your models and, of course, scientific method. and that, that, That's baloney. We consider an idea without accepting it. So, yeah, we listened to 2,000 years of Aristotle saying that, uh, and that's the way you should be. So if somebody comes on with a new idea, a new theory, a new I whatever, you should try to consider it. And that's one of our problems. Uh, give the voice to the voiceless. And there, this is where science advances. It doesn't happen outside the mainstream. So if you want to see where science is going, then this is the place. Um, who we are not. We're not. We don't have a specific point of view as an organization. Uh, we're a general science organization. We're, uh, well, no, I'm sorry. We're not a general science organization. We don't we don't look at all science. We look at there's so many big problems in physics and cosmology. They're huge. They're enormous. They're gargantuan, and we're going against 
billions and billions of dollars and lots of egos and people who think they're so smart. Uh, so we're not a general science organization. We go after physics and cosmology because we know fundamentally there's some big, 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 big problems. Um, and we're not new age. We're not conspiracy or UFO. And we stick to the foundation of science like gravity fields, magnetism, tectonics, math, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, our websites, uh, you can go visit us at Science Woke. <clears throat> it's an online magazine for critical thinkers. Uh, we are looking maybe to get a new name, but of course uh, that takes some time. So this year we're going to look to maybe rebrand it because linguistics people usurp words. Um, I know because I'm a linguist. I got a master's in linguistics, and my job for 30 years is getting computers to understand language. So I think about language and words and what they mean. I think woke is a fine word myself. Um, unfortunately, people take it when the woke, what happened? You want to get to a short story on woke? Woke was a word that, that said, oh, people are critical thinkers and their eyes are open. The people in power who didn't like that purposely made that into a bad word so that now we fight each other. Uh, it's terrible, but uh, I think it's totally fine. But connotations come and go um, and they change, but... Uh, people weaponize that word for pol political reasons, and it's stupid. Um, Naturalphilosophy.org is uh, a critical thinking community. Go on there. <clears throat> you can, um, in fact, uh, uh, join in conversations. You can register, and you can also pay some uh, help and support the uh, uh, organization. And we also have a Wikipedia with over 10,000 pages. Yes, 10,000 pages in the Natural Philosophy Wikipedia. It's closed to the public. Why? Because if we open it up, they'd all tell us all these things aren't what we think. Uh, that, that's not what the, how do you say, the consensus of the human race is. And of course, the consensus of the human race is never the new stuff it's never the new ideas it's never the people who are pushing science forward so um again i did talk about this already um and you can uh, <clears throat> become a member we have monthly members of 5 10 25 50 dollars um it is automatically uh, taken out of your bank account or from your credit card <clears throat> We have a membership uh, plug-in for WordPress. That's how we do it. And we have annual memberships of 35 if you're a senior, 50, 100, 250, 500. And, of course, we accept do donations. And I do want to thank everybody. We Every month, when we, month rolls around, the beginning of this month, uh, I see the automatic payments. we got numbers of people at the bronze level, $5 a month. It's not much uh, to give to help this organization and critical thinkers going. And we do people do have people who uh, out for the annual. And we do also have people who give donations. It is greatly appreciated. And uh, we really, really want to thank everybody for their donations. And of course, I'd like to thank these pe people specifically for their patronage because they are uh, patrons and they have donated a good amount of money, and I want to thank them. Dr. Cynthia Whitney, of course, who is um, our chief uh, uh, research scientist from the CMPS, PhD in relativity from MIT. How come she thinks relativity is wrong? She got a PhD in it, for God's sakes. Uh, maybe I can try to get her on. She is older now, uh, but I may try to do that. Uh, Nick Percival, who is often here, uh, he has his own channel, Nick of Time. you got to watch that. Um, he uh, gave gave a talk. If you haven't seen that, look up uh, uh, on our, web, our YouTube channels, either on CMPS web, uh, YouTube channel or Dissident Science, talk, uh, Nick. And he has been a generous don donator, a donator <laughs> patron, patron to our organization as well. Duncan Shaw, an anonymous person, my father, and Kurt Renshaw. And again, uh, we have a, a, a button for donating. Uh, we do have uh, the CNPS 2021. We're going to make an announcement this this uh, month. Uh, it's an official launch this month, and we are accepting papers. So if you want to uh, publish in our proceedings, which we publish uh, normally every year, uh, you can and just send an email to proceedings at naturalphilosophy.org. And yes, you can have published it in another place. Uh, so we're very happy to publish. Uh, and it will pl take place uh, in the fall in 2021. Uh, and it will be online. And it'll be actually a, a great fun. We plan to use both more formal presentations and Zoom 
and the Zoom part will be for us to sit around and discuss like we do in the uh, regular uh, conferences. So uh, we hope to have a good mixture there of that. Um, and our publishing is really going well um, between, I'd say, April and May. You're going to see two books come out. I don't know if the third one may be, may perhaps, but we have of all three books we're publishing this year, two are ready to publish. One just happened. Uh, ready to publish in the uh, a final version from George Coyne, uh, Not Finity, Matter in Motion. I think he's changed that title again. But regardless, it's okay. It's about consciousness and the Big Bang. No, it's not about how the Big Bang's good. It's how, how, how it's a bad idea, bad theory. Um, he argues that very extensively. Also ready to publish a book just called Ether. It's over 100, 400 pages. Um, the person's pen name is Ramsey. Uh, that after many years, I'm talking about many years, ask my father. He is the uh, book boss on that, as we call putting it, uh, putting it together in the, we use Overleaf. And anybody here who wants to use Overleaf, it's a way to uh, put your papers and or book into book format that you then can go to PDF. But it's used by everyone who does publishing around the world. So we have that as a, a bonus for your membership. So if you do have a membership with uh, organization CMPS, you can can in fact uh, use overleaf.com, uh, I think it is, and uh, be able to publish. In fact, that's what we use to publish our proceedings. And we also are out to our first reviewers. My father and I sent our Principia Mathematica 2 book. Uh, the title is A Complete Tool for Hacking the Physical Universe. And we have that out to two people. Uh, we're now, we are not asking for reviews. So all those people who want to grab the book and see, oh, what are these guys doing? It's got to be all wrong. Uh, that's going to happen <laughs> on its own. What we're trying to do is get people, people we have two sets of readers. One, uh, our first two preliminary readers, we're going to there, and then... Um, <coughs> Uh, have them because we, they are, uh, how do you say, subscribers and they like our, our model. So it's good to have people like that. <coughs> Excuse me, and I'm sorry. This morning, my throat is not good. I usually have a booming voice here, but anyways, we do have that out to two people. Once that's done, we're going to do the corrections. And we have a second group, and that second group is really not, again, for review. They're, help, they're going to help us with the readability, both in the words, the concepts, and the, the diagrams. And then after that, we will publish it. But we will be using... Um, KDP, that's the Kindle Digital Publishing, uh, and that will, of course, be available on Amazon in both ebook form and the, and uh, 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 soft what's it? paperback. I tell you, I don't have Alzheimer's, do I? I'm 61 only. Uh, anyways, um, we're very excited. So if you're interested and if you have a book or even you have papers to put together, uh, we can help you with that if you like to do so. We do have... Um, a sort of format we use. This is sort of our um, format for our covers. This cover needs to be changed. Got to put a photo in the back, etc. Um, there's a cover for my dad and I's book. Uh, no photos in the back. Uh, that's put them inside. But anyways, uh, <laughs> if you are interested, that's what we have. And oh, play coming attractions. Let's make sure I get this right. You saw that right. We've got James Maxlow coming back as well. But we've got lots of people here, um, which is great. We've got Phil Borker coming up. He's going to talk about his finite theory. Oh, it's all wrong. No, folks, get the attitude. Please get the attitude toward what is going on and keep your mind open. That's what's most important. So Phil is going to be talking about his work. You always find work. My dad and I couldn't our, our, our book and our ideas about how the universe works couldn't exist if we didn't spend a lot of time reading about other people's stuff. We stand on the shoulders of people like Burkert and Danu, and um, now we are also uh, uh, standing on, on uh, Newton and other people. So anyways, knowing about other people, of course, disruptive uh, rewriting the rules of physics that will be coming up with um, in May, I believe. We'll be coming up with uh, Stephen Bryant 
really great guy talking with him and this is going to be a lot of fun we got um dennis mccarthy he's going to be talking about thomas north and shakespeare <laughs> what uh following in the footsteps of the great people of this the npa which was that was what this organization was called 20 years ago they'd often have people outside physics and cosmology talking about critical thinking but this is sort of a ringer and the reason we know no uh uh this is because he has a great talk go back on our channel look up um the uh natural philosophy and dennis mccarthy and expansion tectonics he gave a great talk on flora and fauna i may have him do that again because we've got a lot of new people now a lot of times people can't get to all those videos so um and of course yep dr james maxwell is back because now he can i think he can start at 10 p.m and go to bed at midnight after the session's done in Perth, Australia, I think it is. Don't get me on that. He's going to kill me. But it's on the West Coast, not the East Coast. Sydney's on the other coast. So I think that's right. And, of course, are you next? Uh, we do have actually a couple of other people have contacted me. We're looking at what they are proposing to talk about. And um, we'll have them on. Uh, my, my goal is to give people a forum and for the, let the world judge and uh, we are not an organization that supports anybody's theory. We support all, everyone's theory. Um, that is, of course, if they are in, in what we in a in a way that we think are uh, it, it done in a scientific use a scientific method, and no different from any other other science. So, alrighty, and oh, play, play today's bumper. All right, let me do that, Dave. Okay, I believe this is it. <laughs> what a name. I tell you, when you throw this, all this stuff together, you want to press the right button. Here we go. So, yes, today is Convince Me Ether Exists. But before we go, if you're going to convince me, you got to know what I think right now, okay? And I'll tell you what I think. It may be surprising to you, all right? And that is where I am on ether. And ether theory could be correct. I think that's the biggest difference between me and every and all the people who are etherists. You don't hear... I, I, I hear... I know of one person only... And I know a lot of etherists. One person only who's an etherist. I'm saying this to you, everybody. In fact, I'm going to put this right. I'm saying it to all of you. I only know one of you. And it's nobody who's ever on here that say, says ether could, could be wrong. Everybody who's an etherist, for some reason, thinks that ether is right. So, um, anyways... I am a person who thinks about this every day. So um, whether ether is right or our particle model right. So to me also, I think it's very confusing because people usurp ether for everything. Oh, there's an ether in the universe. Oh, uh, Franklin, I know you say this. Oh, you and your dad, uh, just get over it. You're an ether, ether theory. No. Ethers are waves in a medium and we have to start understanding that it's one of the problems with ether we always are saying oh anything that fills the universe ether now what it is here's what you want me to give you the brutal see this this is science police um this is science police you see this and i'm not i'm not going to lie to you i'm going to give you the brutal truth it's the um ether is something that people want to uh they want it so badly that they're going to call anything and everything ether they can. They're going to try to get the mainstream to, to believe in ether. They're going to say, oh, Dave, you and, you're going to go to ether. Oh, Glenn Borkert said to me on, on camera, and I, he's, he and I can debate. We're good. We're good. We're allowed to debate. This is just debating. He says, David, you'll come around, meaning I'll come to ether. It seems like everybody, want, instead of looking at it critically, ether, you're it seems like ether's job is to say how they make everything in that it's ether it's ether that's what it is i'm sorry but that's what i see 
I, and it comes from the fact I don't say ether, ether, you know, person when we when I first talk about my dad and I's theory, he goes, well, this is what we think it is. Could it be right? It could be totally wrong. I mean, that's the right attitude to have because it is wrong. Every theory is wrong. Every model is wrong. So admit it. If you go up there and you are just so fixated with it. So anyways, so this is where I am. Waves in a medium. That's what ether. That's how ether works. And we're going to watch a, we're going to watch a video about that. Okay. Gravitons are not ether, even though, yes, I know you have Newton and he had this lumen, lum, uh, lumen, lumen, ether light. And he talk, they talk about gravity. But the problem is we have to get what we can't just say everything is an ether we have to have some types of definition it's in my way my main my idea is ether is our, our waves in the medium um glenn burker i'm pretty sure thinks that most people and jeff he i'm sure thinks that as well but gravitons are not ether and in fact the gravitonic model isn't an ether model in my opinion and did newton at his time know the difference between the two it was, they, were, they didn't know so people read into it oh um, Einstein talks about ether. So it, it, it seems that what I see with ether people is they're always saying how, oh, Einstein loves it. Oh, Newton loves it. Um, oh, when they talk about space time, that's really an ether. Oh, it's. Guys, that's not the way to go about anything in science. Science is not a convincing, it's not politics. And that's one of the things that bugs me. Like I said, I know one person who's an etherist who said, Ether may be not the right answer. Oh, I know. The wrath is coming at me. Bring it on. Bring it on. Anyways, um, the particle model uh, theory could be correct, but we have. Could be. Um, waves of particles, that's, uh, that's how we do light. They all travel together like waves of bombers. Um, and no, it's not a photonic model. And no, it's not an ether model. It's not. And if we think in our profession, in our area, in our area that we all love to think about, I mean, we're all critical thinkers, hopefully, and we're all thinking about all this, we have to start identifying and talking with the same words. If the rule is in science that this word that I have can mean anything, who cares then? What, does, what do those words mean? I mean, what does that mean? What does the word mean? If we can't understand that ether, what ether is, which is a medium which waves are transmitted uh, emitted through collisions, I don't know. And, and, uh, and the photon model, the particle model, we, we hear this all the time. A photon model has, has photons. It doesn't have waves of particles. It's not the same. Photons, a, phot a photonic model, for instance, Newton. He had bigger ones and smaller ones, and somehow they carried frequency. That's why dad says, <laughs> you look at, at mainstream talking about it, you got this sort of like package, and in this package it's carrying frequency in it and all that stuff. And of course, ethers are going, yeah, that's right, there's, there's a reason for ether. Well, there's another model. So I, where I am, ether, ether could be correct. I am not convinced that it can't be. Um, if you ask my opinion, um, as, as David D. Hilser's gut feeling, gut reaction. I've known about ether for 30, 40 years, and it just, nothing when I'm like a light bulb in my head, like, ah! And I've had other things happen. So in my aha moments, ether isn't one of them. Never has been. Where my dad's model of light, that was. Of course, this is me and my opinion. So it's not, could it, could the model, particle model be all wrong? Yeah. Could the ether model be all wrong? Yeah. Could the ether model be right? Yeah. Could the particle model be right? Yeah. Could both of them be right? I don't think so, because they're very different. But that's that's not for us to decide. Okay, what is ether? We're going to run this um, uh, video on it, uh, ether. And uh, I like this one a lot. In fact, it's got 60,000 views on Jeff Yee. I'm jealous I have um, view count envy. <laughs> Because you know it's important, you know, being a YouTuber, and it's 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 not whether or not you're a good person and you're a good critical thinker and people enjoy talking with you. It's how many clicks you get. Get. I'm kidding. I'm being totally sarcastic, of course. But Jeff Yee puts together these great videos. Um, I'm a super fan. I love his model. 
and it's an eth it's an etheric model. Um, we sort of go at it a little bit about what it really is, but I thought he put together a good good uh, video. We're gonna watch it. Um, I need you people in the green room or in the um, um, chat if you can please let me know to make sure you can hear this. I hate having it um, uh, be show uh, showing up. So, uh, um, anyways, let me get that up there. And uh, here we go. You guys hearing that? They're not hearing it. Okay, good. See, that's what we need. So I'm going to remove this from the stream. Um, stop the screen share. I'm going to share again because when you're sitting here doing these things and um, I may just, let me see if I can do this. Um, okay. All right. I think I've got it now. So I'm going to share the screen. I heard it. Share audio. Let's try one more time. If it doesn't work this way, I'll go to YouTube, folks. And you can actually more specifically call it what? More specifically call it what is the ether. And if we go back to early times, early Greek times, the word comes from Greek mythology, where it was the essence, the air that the gods were breathing. Anyway, Plato and Aristotle used it as they defined the elements, at that time four elements. Medieval philosophers continued to use this idea of the ether as a fifth element, and they associated it with the motion of planets, you know, moving around space, and space includes an ether with a known density. By 1687, Sir Isaac Newton published his famous works on gravity, and he used the ether as the medium for explaining how gravity worked. Now, Newton also did a lot of work on light, which has known wave properties, and he used the ether, again, as the medium for moving waves. But a few centuries later, an experiment was conducted by Mickelson and Morley to detect an ether, and the experiment used something called an interferometer. Now, the bummer part about it is it failed to detect an ether. And further experiments, even beyond Mickelson and Morley, which also used interferometers to be able to detect an ether, also failed. So it showed there was nothing wrong with the experiment or the apparatus that Mickelson and Morley were using. It just said, hey, there's no ether, ether. Which meant by the 1900s, physicists had to conclude that the ether did not exist. And they built particle physics theories without it. But if there's only empty space in the universe, And light has known wave properties. You know, the question is, what is waving? You know, the answer in physics is, all right, light is a particle, it's a photon. But that still is problematic because in that photon, there are still wavelengths that describe light and other types of waves. Light has different colors. You know, red versus blue are different wavelengths. So still, even in a photon, something has to describe what causes those different waves and wavelengths. And every other known wave has a medium. A medium is a substance which allows the wave to travel. A sound wave travels through air. A water wave travels through water. An earthquake, a seismic wave, travels through Earth, the material of Earth. We'll get into a little bit more detail here. <clears throat> a water wave is the motion of water molecules, literally H2O molecules. It's a vibrational pattern. And a sound wave is the motion of air molecules. Air is the medium in this case. And so if every other wave has a medium, we have to ask again, does the ether exist? 
And if it does exist, why was it not detected in experiments, including the Michelson-Morley experiment? And the explanation starts with this. Right? Shortly after the Michelson-Morley experiment, Hendrik Laurent suggested that the experiment, the interferometer, failed to consider length contraction. By the way, this is a Nobel Prize winner, and the Laurent's factor later was used by Einstein in relativity, and it can explain length contraction. Now, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it would have been difficult to build an experiment that considers length contraction, but computer simulations now are able to do it. And what we see here on the left is exactly what Mickelson Morley witnessed. There was no phase detection in the wave, in, in the light wave for the splitter there. But if you consider a interferometer that is in motion, you do see that phase detection as a result of length contraction. And remember, the Earth is always moving. It's the uh, cause of length contraction is that not only is the Earth spinning, uh, but it's also going around the sun, it's going around the galaxy, but more importantly, it's moving at a very fast velocity in the universe relative to other galaxies. And while that doesn't prove an ether, it could explain why it was failed uh, to be detected. But this is the reason why I am so passionately passionate about the ether, is this simple equation. The simple equation in energy wave theory calculates particle energies, calculate, uh, calculates uh, forces, but without it, without that one symbol that you see there that is highlighted, everything fails. There are no calculations. It is not possible. And that symbol is a density property. And density implies waves that are traveling in a medium. It's a given mass per volume unit. So perhaps there is an ether. If the ether does exist, here's the strange thing about it, more than a century of particle physics has been built on a missing but extremely critical property of the universe. And even this man, Einstein, he was not opposed to the ether. In fact, he's quoted on a handful of times saying that the ether could exist. Okay, that was very good. Um, and I guess he does say, which is really good, he does say, in fact, um, that if either exists, which is really good. I, I, do, uh, I do respect uh, very much uh, Jeff Yi and his work. Um, there's only one thing that I think he gets wrong in this, but I'm going to talk a little bit more before we get into discussions. But uh, the thing that I totally disagree with is his <coughs> says, Oh, air and water and, and wave. Everything we know uh, that is a wave goes through a medium. Not true. Um, you have a real problem, all of you. you. If you believe that, then you must turn off your computer. You must not look at anything you're doing right now and tell the world that nothing exists because in the computer world, because guess what? We're sending waves of particles that are not going, that are not waves in a medium through digital, uh, in, a, in a digital way, uh, which is very much what my father came up with, a, a medium of light. So, for the answer to the question that waves, well, let me, let me get to it, okay? I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I just wanted to say that. That's a huge disagreement I have with him. But again, kudos for him, hats off. Uh, physics police gives him an A plus for saying, if it exists, He's got the right attitude. Okay, so let's take a look at, um, here we go. Here are the ether theories in uh, Wikipedia. Ether theories, ether, ether drag hypothesis, Einstein ether theory, etherical force, hammer experiment, all these things, Lesage theory of gravity. I do not include that as an ether. Um, I think that's totally different in my opinion. Being confused is part of of history, um, lum lum luminiferous ether, um, the, the Renz ether theory, light dragging effects. Um, anyways, 
let's uh, take a look at some other things here. Um, luminif luminiferous ether, of course, is this idea that there's this ether out there and we move through it. It's a postulated medium for the propagation of light. Uh, the ether hypothesis was uh, the topic of considerable debate throughout its history. You notice it's talking about it in the, uh, the as if it's already not, it's not accepted, it was a historical thing, and it, it required the existence of invisible and infinite material that, uh, with no interaction with physical objects. And I don't, oh man, these are from, I believe, Wikipedia. I don't have to agree with a lot of this, but the idea, again, as you can see here, is there's this ether, we're moving through it, and there's like points of reference and all that, and then you get into all the problems with relativity and, you know, how are we moving, is the ether moving, how is fast is the ether moving, because like uh, Jeff said, we're moving, or you know, around the sun. The sun's moving around the galaxies. The galaxies are flying through space. You know, what's ether's relationship to it? Um, where's the you know uh, real reference frame? And that's always been a problem, even with me. Um, but anyways, that's what you know. One one of the things for those people who don't know a lot about the ether. Um, the, of course, there's a negative outcome suggested that ether don't exist, but of course we already had that. I put that video in because I thought it was a lot either easier. Uh, general relativity, actually, a theory. Uh, let's say we may say according that according to general relativity of relativity, uh, theory of relative relativity space is endowed with physical qua uh, qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. And again, this whole idea that relativity has an ether because you have space-time and it bends. Of course, if you have something bending, it's got to have physical property. Um, so general relativity is often considered uh, there to be related to some type of ether. Quantum mechanics can be used to describe space-time as being non-empty at extremely small scales, fluctuating generally uh, particle pairs that appear and disappear <laughs> incredibly quickly. You know, this again, the idea is there's something there, um, and uh, those uh, come and go. That's just another idea that people have. I think I looked this up on Wikipedia as well. So there's still a lot of people talking about this, and of course, this mechanical gravitational ether. Um, again, I, I don't like that because you're you're. It's like saying you know uh, rocks and oranges are the same, and to me they're not at all. Because mechanically, if you look at ether, and mechanically, if you look like uh, at a gravitonic model with the gravitons, where you have particles just moving in space in all different directions. Um, that's very different from the transmission. And again, I think that, again, this all comes down to the wave particle duality, you know, people that can't make up their mind, et cetera, et cetera. It comes down to, we don't have a, a model for this, any of this that we all can agree upon. Um, uh, there are some conjectures and, uh, and proposals. This is under uh, Ether, you know, according to point, uh, Ether and Dirac and Bell and all that, and Newton's and other theorists, uh, there might be a medium with physical properties. That's great. They get an A plus for might be a lot better than, unfortunately, the, I, I believe the distant community who is just, um, I don't hear that enough. Um, you can argue for it and you can be right. I told you it can be right. But we got to stop this. This, in, it, you know, like we're totally certain. Why do you think people run away from us? You got to say, well, we think this is a good a model. I think ether is a good model. Here's why. Okay, Albert Einstein said, of course, according uh, to general relativity, blah blah blah. Ether, according to general relativity. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he he also did this. It's sort of repeating. Uh, John Bell in, in uh, 1986 interviewed uh, Paul Davies in The Ghost of in the Atom has suggested ether theory might help resolve the EPR paradox by... Uh, as Alexander Unserker says, these people are putting arbitrary packages together with arbitrary attributes and then fighting over what attributes and packages exist. And the universe is like, uh, doesn't care about that. Anyways, um, the modern theories, again, uh, they're all Newtonian. Uh, they all try to describe light. Uh, the new ones say there's no charge. They all have ether. Uh, oh, there's one. It doesn't. Um, and uh, I know that uh, Yonel Denou, who says that magnetic fields are swirling, he says swirling ether. We just say swirling particles. Uh, we do uh, uh, talk about that, uh, where ether people do talk about that, in gravity, and electricity, quantum level, etc. Um, 
Oh, that's in there twice. Uh, there is a dissident database um, by uh, Jean de Climont. Uh, I, I'm terrible at French. But uh, in that uh, database, uh, which is, I guess, in a book publish, I looked up Ether, and you can see there's quite a few people who have Ether. I think he has cataloged about 6,000 people, and he has Energy Ether, Fluid Ether Descartes, Fluid Ether Lesage Newton, Fluid Ether Yarkowski, Fluid Ether Fractal Universe. Oh, that's not it. I'm looking at the Ether. Math Ether, um, Plasma Ether, Solid Ether Lorenz, Superfluid Ether, Two Fluids Ether. So you can see there's quite a lot of dissidents out there who actually um, believe in ether, and he spells it with E-T-H-E-R, which of course is unfortunate because we do actually have something in the real world that you can point to and hold in your hand, and at least in a bottle form, uh, an ether. So um, here, oh, here it is. Sorry, I, I, I put that, now it's bigger, so you can take a look at it. Uh, Ritz Ballistic Theory. Oh yeah, I remember that one. Um, anyways, here's... The problem with ether, etherists, and I've already told you this, inca inca incapable of admitting there are other plausible models. I know no two people. I know Jeff said that it is, um, but the certainty is is annoying. Okay, uh, to put it uh, nicely, um, ignore all the problems with ether. If you were to take all of you etherists today from the CMPS, and we were to go back in time, which is impossible. No, it's not possible. But if we could get all the people from the MPA 20 years ago to sit in a room with you, they would come up with, with problem after problem after problem with, with the Ether model. And what has happened is that these problems that they knew about and talked about a lot have disappeared into, excuse my language, the Ether and... Instead of us addressing them today, we don't. Somebody does. One of them does do, and that's Borker, because Borker's been around that time. He knew, and he was fighting for the ether, so he's tried to resolve these problems. Um, the size of the ether he has, the, the shape of the ether he has, to that to specifically um, c combat the problem of transmission through collision and then also transverse waves like you know something like even like a laser so it's just like doesn't exist which is I, oh man i wish i could bring these people back most of them are gone but anyways for some unexplained reasons etherists all try to explain gravity with ether and not only that everything else with ether it's like, I call it the cockroach that ate Cincinnati. Uh, it's like from an old movie or something like that. Uh, and the idea is, oh, ether. No one knows, it, you know, we don't think it exists, but it does. And it describes everything. It describes, it can make a toothpaste out of it. You can make gravity out of it. You can make magnetic fields out of it. You can do anything out of it. And that's what they try to do. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I, 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 Try to understand why is it that you must explain gravity and light with the same thing? Why? In our model, it's all particles. It's just the way the particles move. But I, I don't get that. And I see what we see today today is like lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people spending lots and lots and lots of time trying to make an ether, which is a ether to me is came from light that's the idea yes the ether that was out there but people when i look at it it's a way that people light is the unexplained thing and people when they first start out i i've never oh, wait, this is interesting name a person that you know that's an etherist that started out with gravity it's always the other way around so the idea is ether will explain everything uh everything's made out of ether okay i i just I don't something I don't like that. It doesn't make sense. That why? I mean if you can show me to show it to me that you can is not that it is. The question is, is that the best way to do it? Um, and also fix it on a subset of prop problems. We 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 are constant etherists are constantly worried about Michael some Morley. You saw that. The null ether. Well, first of all, you have to believe in the ether the way the etherists did in the nineteenth century, folks. You know, ether is 
can be in many different forms that's in the universe. Uh, you've got the ether that sort of gets, when it's closer to mass, there's more of it, like Burkert, uh, entrained ether. Lots of people have the entrained ether. So, and transverse waves. Uh, so, well, that one they should be fixated more. Actually, that's a good one to be fixated on. <laughs> um, problems with ether. Um, sight and light are extremely important. And I think that's why people are so fixated on ether. Like, like Jeff Yee says, every wave that we know about is through a medium. And so because light is really is the, gives us more information about the universe for we humans and, and animals, um, then we are, it's extremely important. So then ether becomes extremely important. And uh, we can't get the water and sound waves out of our mind. We can't think that, oh, we do send digital uh, waves of particles through um, fiber optics and it comes back to me as, and we use that to get information and, and we can describe waves perfectly fine with that. That's another model, this is my dad's model. And I'm not here to say that's right or wrong, but there's another model. It doesn't matter if it's right. It doesn't matter if it's wrong. It matters that there is another one. And if you're an etherist, you've got to think in mind. If I were an etherist, I'd be thinking, well, maybe in the de Hilster model with David and Bob are, is right. That's what I think, because I think the same thing about ether. It can be right. I will say it again. Um, and our intuition can be wrong. That's what I'm talking about. Light, light can only be waves in a medium. No, there are other waves. Um, any of us have an intuition that ether is a medium for light? Uh, of, of Oh, this is, yeah. There's many of us including me, it, it just never hit me. It was not something that I gravitated for. In fact, I looked in the chat, and I do see people in the chat who are not etherists. So we're out there. Um, we're not out here. And I think it's a great debate. I really do. Uh, but I think ether right now um, is shooting itself in the foot because we've fallen in love with ether way too much, in my opinion. Um, problem with ether, and this is my list, not the list from the MPA. Transmission of light for billions of year, light years through collision. Think about it. You've got a medium, and this is one of the things people call the density or the elasticity. You've got to transmit a wave 10 billion light years for 10 billion years. You've got to have collisions through the universe, and it's got to come to my eye. Okay? And that's different from like what a photon model or a particle model like we have, which is they got to just get here. They'll get here traveling through space. But how? Um, it's not an efficient way to transmit information. Here's, here's what I tell people um, when I look at in this. Again, this is me, David D. Hilster, talking about it. Put a room, go into a room that holds a thousand people. Okay. Now have them all start to talk. I dare you to be able to come up with a way to listen to every one of those conversations with high fidelity. Now we're talking about when I look around, when you look around, the fidelity of light is absolutely extraordinary. And if, if you look at waves, multiple waves in a pond, you look at multiple waves, you look at, at, at sound. You get too many people talking, the sound waves collide on each other, and it's mush. How is that going to go 10 billion light years? These are Dave Dealster's questions. Um, and of course, transverse laser, laser light. Okay, yes, you shine a laser at the moon. It, come, it, it goes from a small beam about that big to about, uh, I think it's six kilometers wide. That's still pretty sharp. Um, can you do that in a medium? Yeah, you can get, like you said, you can make arbitrary packages with arbitrary attributes and then perhaps explain it. Maybe someone can. And of course, you have the double slit with a single photon electron acting like a wave. You have a, um, a person from the MPA who's a friend of mine who's reading our book right now, Luis Sarabon from Brazil from Niterói in Brazil, he presented to our NPA a paper on how he could do the, show the double slit could be done with particles. 
Okay. So, oh, that's the end of the slideshow. And I am back. And I'm sure I should just probably leave because people are hating my guts. Uh, <laughs> but um, I don't know. My dad is there. Um, dad, if you can get any questions up there, he's curating, hopefully, some of these. Uh, if you have a question, the way I would we try to do it is to put up. No one's come on to me. Here we go. If you could in the chat put question colon or comment colon, and um, uh, you can put that up. We'll put that up and discuss it. And if you're in the green room, here's what the rule. I'm going to be very good. Here's the rule. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to tear you apart. I'm going to let you talk about why you uh, want to convince me that ether exists. And again, I am not here because I don't believe it and you guys are all wrong. Um, I will say to you again, and I am being brutally honest. My dad and I are writing a book. We have a totally different model, but it, uh, it is a fact that I think about it every day, that I think about ether. Is there some of the things that in our particle model that would clue us in we could use and say, well, maybe it's not the particle model, maybe it's not the, the wave, the lights as a wave in the ether. I mean, in, in our in our way, but it's it's ether. So I think about this every day. So I'm not, how do you say, 100% convinced, even though my father and I have another model. It says, Kevin Kahn, your model isn't a wave. Hey, Dad, you want to answer that question? I'm going to bring him up. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> You're there. This is oh, come on. All right. All right. No, 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 no. You've just, oh, half the viewers just left. I've got to count at the top. They're all leaving. Don't do that, Dad. Okay. Maybe okay, you right. want to answer about that real quick. Well, I look at the of the wave signal. Uh, it's got that angle. Um, I don't have that. Uh, uh, is that okay? okay? It's okay. It's not the best. Hello? Oh, well, that's my fault, Dad. You're right. Man, I, 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 I applaud you. Um, oops. Um, let's see. Okay. I think. Hold on. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Okay. We got it now. Okay. Is that better? And thank you very much, Franklin. He's, he's my savior. <laughs> Frank is a great guy. Anyway, uh, when I, uh, as a as circuit design engineer, I've looked at a lot of signals, waves, electrical waves. And, and when I do that, you look at it, it has a peak. And there is a spacing between the peaks. And the, the wave can be a nice, pretty sine wave, or it can be pretty ugly. It, it, but still, it has peaks. It has a valley where there are, is, uh, in most cases, they say negative signal, but you could be no signal, and a spacing between it. Well, that's what the particle model is in, in uh, the thing that uh, Dave and I are proposing. Uh, it has a, a group of particles that represent a peak, maybe 10 clustered together. And then, then maybe none, and then ten again, and there's spacing between it. And and so you have a peak, and you have a gap, and you have another peak. So you you end up with a wavelength. You end up with them traveling at speed c. And when when you detect that on a scope, the way I just described it would be it would be an impulse, not a sine wave, a peak. The nothing, a peak of nothing. That's that's a bunch of uh, uh, peaks, not not a sine wave. For a sine wave, you have to have ten, then nine, and eight, then seven, then zero. Never goes negative, and goes back up to ten. Nice in a nice progression with a number. These are all in line, and they have a peak. And if you detect that with a photo detector. Uh, it's going to cause the uh, resistance of the photo detector to generate a, a, a voltage across it, giving you that same sine wave that I see on the scope. 
Okay, so I, th I think the answer to this question, Dad, I think I, I have the answer. The answer is a wave has to have a, have a wavelength and it has to have a frequency, right? So to say that our model is not a wave is not true because waves have to have, and again, I'm not arguing for our model. The question is, what, a, what is really a wave? I look at it as a general th thing. A wave has to have uh, a wavelength and frequency. That's it. I mean, and no matter what your model is, it's got to have that. Our model has that, so yeah, it, it's a wave. So, okay. Thank you, Dad. Um, we get some more other questions. Comment. Here we go. Uh, I'm just going to grab some, too. Says John House, how does the particle model achieve coherence? Um, well, we're having our we talk about that in book. It depends on what you mean by coherence. I've heard two versions of what coherence is, so you'd have to pl to come up with uh, ask with about that. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm Dad. I'm gonna go backwards on these. Um, if you can go backwards on these and put them up there for it, um, I think we have some things that have questions and comments um, there. Uh, we'll go backwards from time. Uh, I see one there. I'm going to put it up, Dad. It's a uh, oh, there it is. Comment. Uh, okay, we already have, we already had that. But the next one I'm going to do. I found it myself, Dad. I'm going to put it up there. Uh, rotate Michelson Morley experiment vertically. Um, I think some I don't know. Somebody has done that. Does anybody know in the green room or in the chat? Is that something that has been done? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure if that would change much at all. But um, again, I think we're sort of fixated on that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Let's see. Question. Is action at a distance possible? Why or why not? Um, if you mean you don't have physical contact and have some action at a distance, um, if you, here's what I can say to you about that is the, the models, what I call the modern models, they're all Newtonian based. Um, they're all not believing in spooky action at a distance. They believe in Newtonian physics. So what that means is for something to have an action upon it, uh, there has to be something causing that action. Now, if you're, I think par, problem, the problem is the spooky action at a distance comes through when you're talking about the double slit experiment where they get into philosophy that's just absolutely ridiculous, which is when they are looking at a detect, they're putting light through a double slit or even a single slit and they um, get a diffraction with it. They also get dispersion if you use sunlight. Um, and then at that point, they're saying, um, well, if I, then they try one photon, what they consider to be one photon or one electron, um, which in a, and if you ask me, it's not one. They never have one. They're actually sending a lot more than one. Um, they think they are. And that goes through the, the slit. Then they can detect where, which one it goes through. And somehow the answer to that has led to this absurd question of action at a distance so the idea is this i believe came from when they were sh they have an explanation of a of an electron there are some videos up there on youtube where i saw electron as this little blob it hits the double slit it literally the blob is like sending a uh, a blob and it's like a water a bubble in in zero gravity through a slit and it's sort of breaks up and then, you know, goes out um, and then they detect, they say, oh, it, it went through this th slit this time and it went through this slit. And um, when they measure it going through one slit or the other, they say, if you turn the detector on, then it doesn't act like a wave anymore. So they get super confused. They think they're sending one particle. They're probably not. And then they start making all these philosophical statements, including um, the, the comment, which was um, action at a distance. So action at a distance to me is the problem of not having any model at all. And they're all just guessing. And instead of saying the model, we don't know, we can't conjecture and make philosophical statements like um, action at a distance, they go and do it. They have history erasing, um, um, uh, um, history erasing experiments that literally say, oh, you don't want to know. This whole double slit and a particle going through and being in two places at once is completely 
us accepting what we see is bizarre and then giving it bizarre explanations like it's magic and it, it isn't science i know a lot of people agree with me on that but i mean that's what i would say at action at a distance it's just a stupid philosophical conclusion for people who don't know or don't have a model for any of this stuff i mean to put it again in the double slit experiment as the photonic expert from the university of connecticut told us after 35 years of working with phot with uh, light we have no idea how light is emitted it travels through space we have no idea how it travels through space it hits a detector uh, we have no idea how that happens and then we detect it and we have absolutely no idea that that happens physics claims to know this is a guy who does it all his, all his life doesn't know so my 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 goal and a lot of the people who are out there to schools today is to come up with a model for the universe and the rest of it has to be explained through that model and we're not going to have these stupid philosophical problems okay we have when matter occupies space it displaces the ether which creates pressure difference in the ether and the result of that is gravity so ether is rarefied inside the earth compared in space you know i know lots of i probably know as many ether theories as anybody maybe even more because i listened to all of them um yeah i've i've heard of that um there's entrained ether there's also flowing ether in and out um yeah um you can come up with a system for it but you still have to explain these problems of how does it transmit light uh, uh, uh 10 billion light years okay if ether pushes on the surface of what of what does it uh, know how much force to use um I don't know. Uh, uh, the question, of course, has to do with somebody's model. That force has to be explained. One of the things my father does ask is, where does the um, the force for these movements come from? Okay, so you have, let's say, a vibrating atom. It vibrates the ether, and that ether then sends out the waves. So, um, you know, if ether pushes on the surface. Again, that's sort of a graviton ether model together which i guess is really popular again uh that's one way to look at it I, I i guess my question to you is why does ether have to explain gravity uh, you know is it because i believe in ether and i want it to explain everything that's not a good answer so if somebody out there who has an ether who i, I really i'm just convince me tell me why gravity has to be uh, etheric um you know, I, I think part of it came from, I think part of it comes from us reading Newton, right? He talks about ether, uh, what I call luminic, you know, well, I, no, I can't say that, but luminiferous ether versus, you know, gravitic ether. Um, doesn't really know. Smartly says, I don't, I have no model for this. Smart guy. And we're still fighting about it uh, all, all this time. Um, let's see. We already got people. All right. Anyways, somebody come up and um, I know Franklin. I know Ian. I think is an etherist. Franklin, you're an etherist, um, and you know I have no problem. I, I will give you a platform. I won't get in your way. You want to talk about it a little bit? But here's here's what I would say is I mean it's interesting to talk about how an ether theory may work. I I'm more inter I'm not interested in that today. I'm interested in knowing why ether has to be it so i guess and, and if of course if that doesn't work then we'll talk about what what your ether does but why does it have to be ether so and anyways um have, I, I probably scared away everybody away now <laughs> or or you can talk about your ether <laughs> all right <laughs> hey hey there there, there he is, saves my butt every time with audio. Thank you very much. For those of you who don't know, um, this is uh, Franklin Hugh. Of course, lots of you do know him. He was in charge of our videos, conferences for many years, which can be a, a lot. And uh, so, and uh, you are an etherist, correct, Franklin? That's right. I'm a rabid etherist. Yes, he is. You can tell. But I, one, one, one thing I, I do. Check them out. Yeah. One thing I do like about your attitude in general for, uh, is you don't go you know, totally ballistic on things. You seem to have a pretty even head. Not only that, you do listen to other people quite a bit as well. So yeah, I'll um, tell you about, you know, I've been, you know, drafts, draft science. Right. Okay? Yeah. So I've been yeah. having a, a debate with him. You know, I think you can debate about, him. Yeah. I, I think he's much more into your camp 
where we were discussing uh, the nature of radio waves. So uh, I think like you, he thinks that, you know, it's, it's a particle. So I, I likened it to like throwing a rock against a wall or something. So, so uh, it, it's, uh, that's the way you get the frequency that he was just saying that, you know, the, the, the only thing that really counts is the frequency. So if I have a 10 Hertz signal, then I'm just throwing the rock, you know, 10 times per second kind of thing. I mean, I think that's kind of uh, what you and your father are kind of saying. Yes, it is, and and I and I and I did have debates with him. I stopped because he's he's totally incapable of being how do you say uh, civil. But um, he he I, I sort of question it because the the only time I heard him ever talk about it was after he I talked about him to him about what we did. So I'm I'm sure he claims to have have thought of something like that, but. Um, I, 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 I'm aware. Would have agreed, I yeah, it's it's close. It's close together. Yeah, yeah. I, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Um, that's the question. But yeah, the, you're the absolutely analogy, right. The analogy he brings up is like you know, if you have a string of dominoes, and, and there's two ways that you know uh, energy can get from one side of the domino to the other. It, it, it's either that well, you, you knock the domino down, and, and the whole string of dominoes had to go. To get to the other side, or you just took the domino, you just threw it to the other side, and that's the other way to get the energy. Over yeah, that, that's the, yeah, that's that is right. And so he, he he is more in our camp for sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, but as an etherist, I just feel that it's uh, it's it's more uh, practical to have the dominoes go through, so that uh, the domino from the one side is not actually the domino on the other side, right? Because that that is what you're you would be claiming in a particle model is saying a radio transmitter that uh, the the transmitter is actually sending a, a particular identifiable particle all the way to the transmitter and then it hits the transmitter and that's how we get the signal so that i mean that's that that's one thing to make uh clear about what the difference is there. right 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 so so for 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 my, and, and again again this is a civil debate my problem is the opposite and that is how does how can you ever imagine that collision which in my opinion is a very uh, how do you say the universe shows it's it's a very how do you say un uh, um, it's not a great method in which to send information long distances that is for you to for 10 billion years for a collision to happen for 10 billion years through an, an innumerable amount of particles to travel to 10 billion i can see particles lasting 10 billion years pretty easily and having them travel through space because mostly most of space is space even through atoms there's mostly space so i have the opposite uh, view so how would you as an etherist it, it convince a person like me that the collisions that collisions can happen like you said you know and they can happen for 10 billion years and and what kind of properties would that be that seems pretty um uh how do you say if i were designing it i wouldn't do it that way yeah there's no way i can prove that a wave can go 10 billion miles other you know 10 billion no wait 10 billion light years 10 billion light years. Yeah. That's that's further. It, it there's uh it's yeah there's no there's there's no f uh, physical evidence I can point to to say that that's particularly possible. Uh, the 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 only analogy that I use in, in that thing is like suppose you're in a swimming pool and you're trying to get a signal from one side to the other, and so well, one way I can try and do it is by uh, I don't know using a squirt gun full of red dye. I can squirt it into the pool and see whether it can get to the other side of the Olympic swimming pool. And because if it's a particle that, you know, the, the dye has to physically get from one side of the pool to the other. And probably you figure, no, it's it's not really going to do that. It's going to get totally lost in this swimming pool, although it's already biased towards an ether, I admit. But oh. if, if you put a speaker in one side of the swimming pool and you loudspeaker underwater and you play that, then I think you would actually very easily be able to receive the signal on the other side because the particle doesn't have to travel all the way, doesn't have to swim all the way across the pool to get to the other side. So as an etherist, I would kind of point to that analogy for, you know, why is it a, uh, a signal can be a long transmissible because the particle does not actually have to go from point A to point B, only the pressure wave 
has to go from point A to point B, which is actually easier, I think. So. Uh, well, no, it's easier. It's okay. That's where we disagree. Mechanically, it isn't easier because what you have, what we see as, for instance, light going through space from a, a star that's 10 billion light years away, space is mostly empty. There's stuff in it all over the place, yeah. And even in our model, it's infinitely down. It's traveling through another, there's, it, there's just infinite levels of it. So yeah, but when you, it's just like shooting an asteroid toward the middle uh, or a probe toward the middle of the galaxy. The, the chance of it going through the galaxy without hitting anything is great. And that's the way we see light is the same way. Whereas in a pool, you have an immensely dense kind of thing. You, you don't have, if you're sending um, a, a, you know, atoms through a dense thing of atoms, which are much close, much more closely packed than, let's say, uh, it's not like, you know, that I think your analogy but doesn't as work. A, as an etherist, we do, in fact, uh, fill space with this extremely dense substance, just like the pool of water. So what we see as, you know, empty space, I mean, even empty space is not that empty, you know, the the density of atomic hydrogen is, you know, not zero. But, you know, the problem with the particle theory would be that we know how collisions work. And if your particle actually runs into any, I mean, just one uh, hydrogen atom, then it will be deflected right now. For sure, sure, so, sure. But your model must show that. Like, just like you can't imagine how a light wave can travel a billion years. I can't imagine how a light particle could travel a billion years and not run into anything. So, you know, one or the other. So. <laughs> well, no, I mean, again, it's the matter of what, how much space there is for that particle. And I think that's the difference. So what we see is particles going through space. For instance, light, if it is one particle, a, a photon could be, and, and I'm not, we don't have a photonic model, but a particle that would be part of a light wave, if it goes through a room, you could have uh, 60 million of them uh, a second be in your room without out ever seeing another particle. So the, the, if you look at the mathematics between uh, the elasticity that's needed and the density that's needed for ether versus the space that you look at for a particle to travel 10 billion years, if you look at that mathematically, in my opinion, it's not, you're looking at physics then, you're not looking about, I can't imagine it. What I'm saying is um, the elasticity of of ether has to be absolutely abs an absurd, absurd level because eventually every collision loses energy. And for the collision to have enough energy to get all the way for 10 billion years through 10, 10 billion light years, that elasticity has to be absolutely amazing. And to yep. me, the, but the idea- absolutely amazing. People have calculated it to be something like 100 million times denser than steel. Right. A reasonable calculation. And uh, but so the question, the question is, which is from the general public, not from me, is if it's 100 times denser in steel, why are we moving around as if it isn't there? Uh, well, as an etherist, I would say we do detect it. That's why when you try and push something the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, uh, you get resistance, even if you're pushing on a frictionless surface. The thing is, is that we cannot there, there is something that's holding the, 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 the mass, the car, back. And that is this incredibly dense um, substance. So that's, that's... So when you send a probe like we have, Voyager, and it's going to continue, most likely it's going to never hit anything um, for a very, very long time, probably could leave the galaxy without hitting anything. That model isn't viable or that's not going to happen? You don't think we can send a probe through that we're going to actually hit something? Uh, well, it hits something all the time, but it's like a spring. I'm just talking about in the in the realm of what we know hit, okay? Because obviously, if you are infinite infinity, it's hitting stuff all the time, yeah. But I'm just talking in the realm of what we Borker would call unicosm in our world, our level. I'm saying that 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 probe could go all the way through the universe, all the way through the galaxy, and for a very long time before it hits anything of atomic structure that would really impede it. Well, that might be true. I mean, we know it hits, I don't know, the, the, it, the interatomic uh, uh, hydrogen gas, I guess. That slows it down. Yeah, okay. Here's a comment here from Harry. The ether is an attempt to imagine a universal substance. 
Yeah, you know, that's a good... Yeah, that's certainly what it is, right? Uh, well, here's here's my question, though, too. I mean, I, I, I'm going to... I mean, this Harry has really good comments. I like that, too. Uh, but this whole idea of a universal sub substance sort of comes... Is that the same? I get the feeling when people talk about that, that's the same as like the ultimate particle or the whole universe is made of this stuff. Um, I'm just wondering, do people have that same idea? It, it, it could be. I mean, that's, uh, but some people like to think of it as something which is mysterious, you know, like give it different names. Right, but he's talking about a universal substance. And one of the things that I noticed that etherists do is that everything is made out of ether, right? The particles are made. Of, I asked Borkert, I asked Borkert, Glenn Borkert, he's an etherist. I said, uh, Glenn, he, he also says ether is super, super, super small. And the reason he does that, of course, is the problem of, you know, transmission and fidelity, meaning, you know, being yeah. able to see that. Well, so, but, so but what, what are your, your but, but what I'm saying what I'm saying is the idea here is my question is is when people say universal substance is that also sort of the idea where people have and this is a lot of people have this a lot including mainstream science sometimes they say it's like an onion that is the universe you keep peeling it there's more layers other people go for that everything's made out of this um, you know Glenn Borkert uh, Jeff Yi, I think, is sort of like that. He's got ether and something else, but there's nothing else below it. My question is, is this universal substance we call ether? I get all the things about how people think that there's ether out there, and I get all the linguistic stuff, I know. But I'm, I'm saying, is this also tied with the idea that ether is a universal substance, meaning everything comes from it? It could be. I mean, that's kind of the holy grail to try and reduce concepts down to like the one thing like i could say ether is made out of electrons for example right and that the only thing that exists is electrons right and then that would make everything so simple right because well it wouldn't because you have a you have a problem you have one big problem it's called the magic my, i call it the magical problem here's the magical problem if the whole world's if the only universe is made of one particle it's got to organize itself it's got to do stuff it's got to uh, it's got to be like group itself together. It's got to be turn itself into atoms. It's got to turn all this kind of stuff. And for it to do that, just magically, you have to have properties. So what you end up with is, is what um, um, Alexander Unser, call, Unser calls, and I say this over and over because it's a great phrase, is arbitrary packages with arbitrary attributes. The quark is a great idea, right? Here you have earth, wind, fire, and water. Then we get to the atom the periodic table. Oh, now we have all these element um, atoms and stuff. Oh, that's great. Oh, wait a minute. They're all made of three things, protons, neutrons, electrons. So somebody in the 1960s in, at, at the Woodstock was sitting around smoking a, a joint going, oh, man, everything should be made out of one particle. I'm going to call it a quark. They made a weird name for it. And they go, everything's made out of quarks. What happens to quarks? Instantly, they go from three to six to nine. They get all these attributes and... It's, again, an arbitrary package with arbitrary... Uh, the attributes are upness, downness, color, things that don't really mean color, half spin. Yeah, like so what happens, what things happens things though, that. is if you're saying that something is made... Oh, let me finish and I'll get you go. Um, something is made out of one thing. It's got to be magical. It has to magically start organizing all by itself. You have no explanation. Whereas if you have an infinite world, the things below it and its movement will cause the things above it and its movements. And yeah, it's like a fractal. We'll never get there. But at least there's a mechanism always below it and above it. So this idea that everything can be made out is, is, is easy, maybe, in our heads. But you've got to come up with arbitrary packages with arbitrary attributes like charge. And all of a sudden, there's it attracts. And it's got mad, it's magical. So I'm just saying the ultimate particle is magical. And I was wondering if universal substance is going along that the ethers does that. And then I want to ask the person, how does it organize itself? If it's a, if it's by well, it, certainly, if there is such a fundamental substance, it would indeed be magical, and probably not really explainable. That's why, right. yeah. If you're going, if you're going I can to go buy that particle, then it should probably be one that we at least recognize. So, for example, but, like, like I said, the electron. Now, the electron is a magical particle, uh, but we're pretty sure that thing exists, right? It's not like I made up, like, you know, circulon or something other on or whatever on, which is what the other ethers do. Uh, I prefer to say specifically, 
I decide to make my ether out of something you can actually recognize. So for example, uh, now I, I'm kind of altering my theory to say that the ether is actually a sea of neutrons because we know what neutrons are, we know they exist, we can measure them. So at, that's easier than saying, I don't know, I'll, I'll make, you know, I call it a positive electron because I think the neutron is a positron electron pair. But I, I think that that's kind of one way to get out of that problem, which is to say, well, I don't know what an electron is, but assuming we agree that those things exist, then we can. But if you have charge, I'll give, I'll go right to you right, right, right away. I understand that. I think you're right in the sense I, I'm, I'm happy to hear you admit, yeah, it's sort of magical. But if you have charge, right, if you have a positron, electron, and there's charge on that, well, charge is a force. Charge, a force in my world is a Newtonian. How does it get a force? Is it magical again or? No, it's not particularly magical. Well, wait a minute. Uh, it's we particularly bring in the bit of magic that we have the uh, the the positron, which I claim is actually physically the same particle as an electron. But wait, wait. Let's get back to the question. I understand what you're saying. Instead of describing your model, I want to know how you have charge and how do things move in that charge. Uh, the way the way you have charge is that you have waves, you have medium. So for right now, just just forget about. Just, just that you have part, some medium. And then you have a particle and the particles collide into each other. And when they do, they ring. So that is a fundamental and magical property, I must admit. But, you know, everything has a resonant frequency. So it's not terribly hard to believe. That. So you think there's, so in your model, is, is the electric field an ether or is that something else? The electric field is actually a wave that's being emitted by the electron. A wave through what? A wave, just like radio wave. Just a like wave that. through what? A wave. A wave through. Wait, wait, wait. A wave through what? What? A wave through the sea of electrons. Oh, okay. Right? So you have waves and electrons. Do you have an ether? Well, that's what it is. There's okay, so your ether is made of electrons. Of okay. Uh, there, okay. But it's not strictly a sea of electrons. It's also a sea of electrons and positrons, whatever. But they're essentially the same part. They're essentially the same particle. And, uh, and, and the curious thing is that when, when an electron and positron are right next to each other and there's no medium between them, there can be no attraction between those things. Mm -hmm. So in the ether itself, it's, it's this mix of checkerboard of, of positrons and electrons, which basically are act neutral because there's no, there's, there's nothing, there, there has to be a medium between two things in order to have a force. And if there's no medium, then there's no force. So at some point, the coolant right. all breaks down. It must break down, right? If you get close enough, the force becomes zero. So there's no infinite. Force. Right. There's yeah. I mean, the Coulomb force. You have to describe it, but yeah, it uh, yeah it's down at right. Time. But exactly, exactly. In which I, I agree 100 percent with you. That is, the universe has levels at to which a force no longer is sort of ne negligible at that point, and something else is going on. But Here's a comment. The uh, the question of you know why does ether get into gravity? theory theories right now, right Typically, mine you know doesn't directly do that but in some ways is that uh, uh, as a newtonian mechanical person who only believes that things get forces on them because you know things collide into it right that's the really the only way that any force can be really be exerted on something uh, that uh, gravity is such a force and that must mean that there must actually be some particles or something that are impacting my body which is causing what i feel is the force and the only apparent uh source of those particles would be the unseen ether so that's Right. No, I agree. I agree with that. I think forces cannot be something action at a distance or pluses and minus on things or eventually has to have a force. But um, here's a comment here. It says the electromagnetic spectrum is is a product uh, byproduct of ether. That's that's the, the standard ether um, model. And so is gravity, light, inertia and mass. Um, ether is ubiquitous, but isotropic in presence of mass. Again, um, I, I understand that model. Um, again, I here's here's what I see 
a lot of times. And it, do we have people in the green room want to come up as well? Okay, I do. I'm going to yeah, bring like you down. Yeah. Listen, thank you so much for your civil discourse. And um, you, I, I always enjoyed talking with you. Uh, thank you very much, Franklin. Um, but here, here is, you know, again, this is a, a, an explanation. But one of the things I'm going to bring up, Bob Gray, I saw his hand was up. Rob, you're going to be coming up next. Um, one of the things I, I see, I mean, a lot of rigor, a lot of effort is involved in this. I mean, I hear, I mean, I see this, you know, uh, Alex uh, Tiger, I see this and he says, gravity is a side effect. Now, I really think this is more, I look again at the linguistics of people's intentions, because we have to, I, uh, my friend and I came up with a computer program. What does it do? It allows us to look at text, put the knowledge that we think he, people have in our head, and look at the text, process that text, and try to get what the intention of what pre people are saying. And I think this whole thing of gravity is a side effect is a wonderful statement. And here's what I would interpret this as a linguist. Oh, yeah, ether is the most important thing. Gravity comes from it. Yeah, there's a million ways you can do it, but it comes from it. And to me, that's like, it's nice but you have to first of all say why does it have to which i have not heard an answer yet the other thing is how does it answer and before i bring bob gray up i'll give you another example uh, what i call the vancouver model for ether um those of you who know duncan shaw know that he has an ether model and it's a flowing ether there are a lot of people who have flowing ether models and why do they have that to explain gravity and here's what happens so i say there's ether and it describes light okay why am i not happy with that why do I now say, oh, I have to describe something else? I think it's an enthusiastic emotional response. It's like, oh, ether's great. I can describe light. Yay. And now you go, wow, what else can I do? Oh, gravity. That's another one you don't know. Oh, ether, we know it has to be light, so it's got to be there. So we're going to make a simpler model. Uh, gra you know, ether has to be part of that. And so you go, okay, that's part of it. Oh, the way gravity is sort of like a pushing force, so it's going to push. Oh, my ether's going to go. Oh, now it's got to go into bodies. If it goes into bodies, it's going to have to come out of bodies. And that's what the Vancouver uh, theory is. And he has this uh, elaborate mechanism how to do that. And absolutely, I'm going to tell you right now, he could be right. I don't know. He could. But to me, it seems to be a... That's where it comes from. Gravity is a side effect. And that side effect, oh, it can happen this way. And people are like, eh, it doesn't matter, because light, that's important. And either exists. And I, 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 get, I, I, I see it more of the psychology that I see of people coming through. But anyways, that's my take on that. So sorry to go on that, but I want to get people's comments up here. I'm going to bring up Bob Gray. Hey, Bob, how are you? Fine, thanks, David. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely, absolutely. Welcome. I'm, thank you. Um, I'm not hearing people talk about, for example, the superposition principle with their models of the ether and right. electrodynamics and in gravity. So if I have two bodies and this body is emitting and it's whatever is emitted is colliding with the other body to produce the force, that means something behind that is now shielded right. by this body. So does right. superposition principle hold strictly? It's it strictly is superposition, or not? And I'm wondering per model. Oh, it's a Newtonian-like model. Something's emitted, and oh, it's bouncing off like billiard balls. Or is an ether model more? It warps the space so that when I put another particle in, it just adds to that warped space so that the third body feels the sum of the two. But it's still a collision though, right? I mean, eventually- I, it, I don't know, I, I'm just throwing it out. When considering the different ether models, the different models of force and so forth, consider explaining the superposition principle or stating that the superposition principle does not hold strictly. It's, it's not strictly true. And I don't know if that might be a way to help um, I don't know, filter the different theories or um, if people, I don't, I don't know, just thought I'd throw that out and see if. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is like, it, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not exactly. I think it's more of what I call. I think people call the shadowing effect. Mm -hmm. Is is that what you're calling superposition? That kind of effect, yes. Yeah, ba uh, basically okay, shadowing of okay. yeah, shadowing effect. If you have let's say you have ping pong balls going in all directions in space right if you put two things together the ping pong ball is going to hit this side more than they're going to hit this because it's blocking it and the tendency or those things will be pushed together but that's sort of called particle behind it or the next charge body behind that is now in the shadow right so it, it's not the sum of the two two individually because now one is in a shadow so superposition doesn't hold it's not strictly true or is the model that whatever is transmitting the force passes through the body and therefore does not create a shadow or does the source warp the ether warp that space and you put another body in it and it just adds to the amount of warp and therefore it is the sum of the two individually and well, I guess the, no I, shadow I guess the shadow. warping yeah the warping part I start to lose you because I'm trying to construct the model physically in my head and what I see in the warp part is I'm not I, I can't I'm not sure I understand I, I know what you're saying but I can't come up with any real physical model to to say what you're saying I end up with collision somewhere because what happens is if you just fill it in if it just appears more like um, entrained ether that's what it is um, Burkert's entrained ether right you have ether particles that are just sort of around um, but um, and and as you get as you get closer to a a a mass you have more ether and that more ether then causes eventually causes what is the, in the colliding of these things what what is the shadow effect somewhat and the gravity I guess um, I I'm not really an expert on on that but I can say. No, right, and I'm not advocating one or the other. I would like to ask. Wait a minute. The rule is if you come up here, you have to choose the sides, and if it's not on my side, you're a bad guy. And if uh, you aren't, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, come on. Come on. I'm the one who, I'm Lillian. Yeah, so. But I'm wondering if anybody in the audience has any experimental evidence for the, um, the failure of the superposition principle in electrodynamics or in gravity. And therefore, there is a shadowing effect. Anybody out there know of any experimental evidence one way or the other? I, I, I don't think I don't know. I don't think there is, and I don't even think there are people doing the models. The only person I know doing models about that, or there's only two people I know. One is Jeff Yi, who's doing a model in a Blender, which is um, you know a real physical model where he's actually paying people to try to come up to to, to verify his vo model is viable. Uh, the other person, my father, who did it with mathematics, which is basically just summing up all the collisions. That gravity isn't. Um, one thing. It's not a field. It's it's just a gajillion collisions and no two collisions ever happen at the same time. So, right. but, okay, well, thank you very much. I'll you. bring you down. I know he, he didn't choose a side, so he's out. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, here's a comment. Uh, Ether is neutrinos to Wall Thornhill. Um, of course, people know that's a trigger word for me. Neutrinos. Um, I'm, uh, if I'm autistic, I'm autistic with that word. And here's what I will say to you. I've heard this for gravitonic models. I've heard it for ether models. And here's my answer to you. Before you hang your hat on the neutrino, go and read about it. Because if, if there's any particle in the, in that, that particle physics has invented, which most of them are invented and don't exist, in my opinion, and a lot of people's opinion, ask Alexander Unsecker, we can throw them out from 1930. So if the particle is after 1930, oh, neutrino was exactly then, then it doesn't exist because our methods of finding what we think we're finding doesn't make any sense. The neutrinos uh, go to uh, autodynamics.org, uh, who is a, one of the great neutrino uh, um, antagonist who did, who who uh, showed why the neutrino was actually postulated. It was postulated because they were applying special relativity to radioactivity or decay cases, beta decay. And what did they came up with? Well, they got, they came up with exactly the energy that chemistry predict, predicted. But because you have electrons going close to the speed of light, meaning 0.86 at the highest speed, then therefore it must have more energy than it does. We don't uh, have it, so we have a chargeless, massless particle coming out of there. And we're going to call the neutrino it was supposed to be called the neutron but at the time neutron was taken that's the history so if you hang your hat on a on a particle that doesn't exist sorry 
And why do people do that? It's because they're trying, to, again, it's an emotional thing. I want to cater to the mainstream. They all believe in neutrinos, even though they don't exist. Um, and we had a lot of, and many people in our organization that know they don't exist and have, uh, in fact, there's an experiment, the Buchner Van de Graaff. Remember Van de Graaff? He did an experiment at MIT, I believe. Uh, I think we have it on the autodynamics.org website. It has an experiment that disproves the electron neutrino. It disproves it. You want experimental? No one looks at it. No one looks at it. Did, did Wall Thornhill look at the experiment in, 19, in 1946 by Buchner and Van de Graaff that show that the electron neutrino does not exist? No one looks at this. This is the same way with the ether problems that people knew about the problems. They don't confront them anymore. They all died. People who died in neutrino. I asked a guy once, I said, what's the origin of the neutrino? Well, you know, it's not important, the origin. <laughs> Jeez. I want to shoot me now. So the answer to ethers, neutrinos, to Wall and Thornhill, I would say Wall Thornhill, no offense. You're hanging your theory on a, on a particle that doesn't exist and go do your your homework on the neutrino and willing it to not exist closing your eyes to the buchner van de graaff um, experiment that clearly shows it that can be repeated today that shows that in fact neutrino the electron neutrino which is the most out of the 17 flavors of neutrinos oh my god um it it um shows it isn't so that's the answer to that um, let's see here. I uh, will answer this one. Your model is contrary because you said space is empty. No, uh, it's empty at certain levels. If you look at it at certain levels, it's empty, but it's not empty. It's infinitely filled and infinitely empty. Uh, what I would suggest is reading uh, Dr. Glenn Borkert, and you will find out that the universe is infinitely uh space and infinitely filled and uh so no it's not a contradiction but we do deal with um something like there's air here there's yes there's ether in our model there's levels all the way down as in borkard says um and particles that infinitely all the way down and all the way up there's no uh a smaller particle every particle has a part and so yes it's a figure of speech when I'm talking about sending a probe through the universe, it's going through an infinite sea of infinite particles, yes. But those particles' impacts on these have to, for instance, if the, uh, the Voyager is made up of atoms and the atoms are mostly space, we know that, and your particle is so darn, darn small, the chances of that particle interacting with that that um, Voyager, uh, even though there's kajillions of them, an innumerable amount of them, it won't interact. So that's very possible. So that's what I would say. Um, not a contradiction. Um, I was talking about, again, if you send a, a ether particle at this level, that those impacts are, are, are very negligible. And when you get down to a certain level, you can just not even worry about them. All right, uh, more people. Ian's here. Jim Marison, you're there. Anybody want to talk? Oh, Ian. Hi, Ian. How are you? Uh, very well, David. Thank you. Um, good to speak to you again. You described me uh, earlier on as an etherist, so I thought I might say a few words um, just about it. Um, sure. First of all, you, might, you might be glad to hear that um, I, I'm not a person who uses ether as a sort of a catch-all for everything. Um, right. I, I mean, the jury is out, I think, on this. It may have other effects on gravity right. or right. whatnot, but I, that's not something I deal with. Um, I, I deal um, purely with a luminiferous ether, or more generally, an ether uh, that uh, uh, permits uh, the propagation of electromagnetic radiation. Right, right, sure, sure. So... Um, you know, th th this has been done in many other respects, but I uh, I, I look at the analogy, which, um, you know, I, I hope you didn't appreciate too much earlier on, but the analogy between, um, you know, audio uh, transmission and transmission of water waves and things like that, uh, they're basically governed by the same mathematical equations, and you can get various parameters. So, in, in other words, <clears throat> so-called empty space does have certain 
properties, you know, which are analogous to elasticity. You've mentioned some of these before, density. Um, you have the permittivity and the permeability, and I maintain also the resistivity. So you, you have a sort of like a, a, an analogy of resistance per, per, per unit length and inductance per unit length and capacitance per unit length. And you just get different properties. I mean, you talked earlier about it being almost inconceivable that over, you know, um, uh, uh, thousands of, 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 of uh, millions of, of light years, this thing could hardly dissipate. But I mean, um, the speed of light is so much greater than the speed of sound. And therefore, the elasticity is so much greater. So what in a water or in air, say, um, might, might, might dissipate in, say, hundreds of meters to, you know, a fraction of its initial uh, magnitude would, would take um, thousands of millions of light years in, 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 in the ether because the properties are so are so different but you have you have you have basically these properties now um, the other thing is uh, you know you have the um, system whereby the speed uh, is um, independent of the speed of the source uh, it's not independent I maintain uh, and others would as well of the speed of the receiver which is contrary to what special relativity says, because that says it's independent of both. But um, to my mind, um, and I know I know we could get into a long discussion about this, but uh, to my mind, the, the the problem with the particle, the purely particle theory, is that you're you're then in a ballistic system, in, in that if if it's a particle being emitted from uh, from a moving source, well then you know it, it, it's like a cannon which which would be moving with a particular speed, and therefore would would emit a cannonball, and you'd have to sub you you have to sum the the, the two speeds which you don't get because it's independent. So if you had a sort of a, an ether, which is static, um, you know, th that would be independent. But one thing, other thing I just might mention, just maybe a couple of other things. Um, I, I personally don't take the ether as an absolute uh, stationary reference frame for the... Well, that was going to be a question of mine, because one, one of the things you never hear these modern ethers talk about is that. I mean, because the difference is, if you have a particle model like we do, they travel, right? You, you don't have that problem of a reference, right? You don't have that problem of the Michelson-Morley. Are we standing still to the ether? Is that, is that what you're talking about right now? Well, I am. Uh, uh, yes, very much so. And uh, I'm saying that um, the... the um, the basic explanation of, of, of uh, MMX um, is that there's practically no um, relative movement between the mainly entrained ether uh, about the Earth's surface and the Earth. In fact, uh, Michelson himself said that's one of the explanations. You know, he didn't say the ether doesn't exist or special right. relativity, you know, which came some years later, explains it all. He, he, basically, that, that's the argument that he accepted and I, I would accept as well. So, in other words, there's an ether which is in the vicinity of, of this large um, gravitational body called the Earth, and it drags it in its, um, its circular, in its elliptical orbit around the sun. But it basically uh, doesn't, uh, practically doesn't drag it in its diurnal rotation, as being shown by various other experiments like Michaels and Gale and so on. Um, and you would have, you'd similarly have an ether um, about the sun and and, and uh, you know a, a galactic ether and so on. So so you you, you can um, measure things relative to that. And therefore, if you apply the principles of hydrodynamics, the same principles, sort of you know Euler Lagrange type systems, uh, you find it actually coheres. It it works very well, and you just get um, uh, you know a, a, a speed which has to be taken into account. Which is basically I, a question I have for you, and, and I understand what you're saying, and I, yep. I think this is very interesting conversation because I think this is where people should be looking at ether a lot more than worrying about um, you know all kinds of other things because this is this is a bothersome problem. So we have galaxies, and they are moving through space. And we have, of course, stars going around the center of galaxies, and we have plants going around those. Where's the ether fit in that's sort of stationary? Again, in a model where, uh, uh, particles move at the speed of light, um, you know, it's moving. 
and if where it's emitted yeah it's a ballistic model so um you have you know well there's some ex explanation of how that works but i'm curious as to where that frame is where i mean there's still a frame i mean it's moving so it does it sort of push around does the whole galaxy then move them between galaxies is it that case that they're slower between galaxies less slow between star i i i don't I, that part of I don't understand. And th th that's a very interesting discussion as well. Um, and uh, do you see, w one of the uh, big uh, conundrums, I suppose, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th was that if uh, Michelson's initial explanation, which I referred to a moment ago, uh, of an entrained ether were true, well, then stellar aberration uh, shouldn't occur because you know, it, it, it's as if um, you don't have any relative movement, and yet the, the movement of the Earth around the sun can be picked up. So what I've done, actually, is I, I've, um, so I claim anyway, uh, I, I've done a bit of um, analysis, and I've said that the the system, the, the, the velocity, you know, speed and direction, that something um, in, experiences from being emitted in a particular ether environment is preserved and the reason for that is is it's it, you know you're you're getting refraction at the um uh, if there's any um interface between one e ether and another and that's basically uh, cancelling out the relative motion so so for example t t you 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 talked about very distant uh, galaxies but suppose you take something like jupiter now um you, if if you um, uh, measure the um, it's a, it's the old uh, Romer experiment, you know, with the the satellite of Jupiter Io, which is going around, and if, if you take it when it's on opposite sides, well, you, you, of the Earth's um, orbit, you, you can you can find the speed of light. But if it's at ninety degrees, if it's in positive or negative quadrature, well, then the Earth is either moving towards uh, Jupiter or the Earth is moving away. At its its speed of of um, revolution around the sun, and that has to be taken into account. So you actually have to have to take say ve is the, the speed of the Earth. V, c plus or minus ve. You actually have to measure that and put that into the equation, and you get the correct the correct value. So you might say, well, how is that? If 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 if, if is it not captured by the Earth's ether and then brought around? Well, according to what I have um, analyzed, so I say that. It was the the light was um, um, emitted in the environment of the ether of Jupiter, and that actually remains. So the same thing w would occur with binary stars. You know where, where we have um, we have binary stars where, independent of the motion of the star relative to the Earth, it is emitted in in, in an ether which is in that proximity, and therefore. It's the same because the, the the velocity of the source does not affect the uh, you know the velocity with which the the the, uh, the rays subsequently come to us. So it's a combination of those two things really: the, the the fact that you have local ethers, and also that the ether in which the light or re electromagnetic radiation is you know originated is actually maintained. The, the, so so it's it's the the relativity, the, the relative velocity between our ether and the ether in which the um, radiation, you know, w w was in the first place uh, originated. So and you're you're talking mostly you're talking about an entrained ether, is that correct? So I, I'm talking about uh, an entrained ether. Now, you, you, I think there was the Hammer experiment. You, there were some other experiments there in the list, but uh, which the, the Rayleigh experiment as well, I think Lord Rayleigh did it, where you got a small, uh, you know, relatively small uh, ball of metal or something, and you found it didn't seem to entrain ether. So it appears that small gravitational objects don't uh, entrain ether, or if they do, it, it's immeasurable. But large um, uh, uh, masses such as the Earth, very large masses do. Well, I, I claim that that is the, the simplest explanation for uh, obtaining a very low value of um, uh, when you try to measure the relative speed between the ether and, and, and the Earth. So it largely does carry carry. Uh, right, right. It, yeah. 
Okay. Well, I'm going to take you down, but thank you so much. I think it is a, a, a very interesting. Somebody had mentioned, I took it down just now about sort of like a, a ether is fixed basically and things move through it and perturbs it. So, but I think it is a very interesting question that you're trying to resolve is, you know, how, if ether is out there, how does it, how is it in space? It's velocity. How does, where is it? What's its density? And those things are really important in, in a theory. So, all right, I'm going to bring you down because we're almost the end here. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Um, here's a question, ballistic argument. Well, the answer to that, um, Franklin, is if the, you say if the speed, if light is a particle, then the speed of light should depend on the velocity of the sender. Uh, it doesn't because if it comes out in the model like we have, that is the, sp the speed of, of a particle around a, um, an atom is at the speed of C, it's going to be released at the speed of C. So that's, that's a solution to that. So it's not an argument against, but I want to thank um, everybody who came on. I want to thank um, my dad for watching the chat out there coming on. I also want to thank Franklin uh, for his many years of uh, working uh, with this and his uh, great conversation uh, civilly. Thank you. And also uh, talking with Bob Gray and also Ian Cohen and all of you people in the uh, chat. I know I didn't get a lot to them i can see a lot of anger and a lot of I, 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 folks again what i would say to you is don't be married to anything um and don't get defensive about it because that just shows either of two things that you are emotionally attached to it and that's not a good event a thing or you have doubts about it and you're afraid to look at those so what, what you always have to do is look at your biggest doubts just like a psychologist does or a doctor does the biggest pain and then try to address that so i think it's very uh, uh very uh, important for us, especially etherists, to keep your uh, open mind, realize that ether is one solution, not the only one, uh, and for everyone to give everything a chance and be out there and be re realize. I always say, folks, we're all trying to come up with a model, and the person that's going to choose it ain't us. It's going to be um, just science in general, and if, if there's a model that one of us come up with, and it seems to push us in a new direction uh, and people more and more accept it. That's how it's going to be happening. OK, so uh, please uh, keep your minds open and everything. So we're going to get out of here. Uh, it was a great discussion. Maybe we'll do another ether one because I know uh, maybe do since I've talked about it a lot, maybe do more just discussion and have people uh, bring it up. But uh, I apologize if I didn't get to all of your questions. Uh, Com questions and comments but i do appreciate all of you guys being here and uh your patronage and and remember of course to subscribe to our channels if you're from a dissident science channel please make sure if you've enjoyed these if you're watching and recording make sure you click down on the like button the more likes we get the more uh exposure we get and also click on that subscribe bell and the little uh push that up to the uh, ringing bell so that you will be a no, uh, alerted when our next video drops or we go live. And let's take it out with some of our videos. And remember, I'm Dave Hilster. I am your science therapist trying to get you to promised land. So stay critical, stay thinking, and ciao for now.